Hey there, crew members, Sullivan's here. So, here's a scenario. You plan to review a 45 minute video regarding the Costa Concordia and tell yourself, Vince, don't cover the whole thing. Stick to the first half. You're gonna bore your audience. But then, after publishing your video, you see all those comments appearing. Yeah, I should have covered the whole thing. So here it is, part two of the Cost of Concordia. We are finishing it. All thanks to my viewers for pushing me to do the whole thing. Without further ado, let's get back to it. Now the Coast Guard calls the captain because he's just learnt that the captain has abandoned ship. The captain claims, uh, uh, no, actually I slipped and I fell into one of the lifeboats. Ooh, I'm a klutz. But now that I'm on board, I, I may as well head back to shore. DeFalco tells the captain to get the fuck back on board. And the captain kind of acts confused and then effectively refuses. Yeah, it's all true. The whole conversation between them was recorded. You can actually listen to it on YouTube. And trust me, it's worth it. By now, you probably have a good general idea of why Gregorio de Falco is mad. But let me give you the whole picture. As a Coast Guard officer, before sending your personnel on a search and rescue mission, there are three things you want. Information, information, and even more information. And your prime source of information should come from the boat in distress itself. In a distress situation, the officer of the watch has the duty to relay the state of the emergency to the authorities via radio communication. But as you saw in my part one video, the captain lied to the Coast Guard the entire time. And even worse, when the Coast Guard ships arrived on the scene, the bridge was already empty because all the officers had fled like a bunch of cowards. So there was no one to update them on the situation on board the ship. How many passengers left? Are there any injured? They had no idea. So imagine being in Gregorio's position. You send your personnel to investigate the situation. Then you suddenly learn that a massive cruise ship is sinking Thousands of people are trapped and there are no officers left on board. So essentially, Captain Scatino left Gregorio with a crew in complete anarchy. No one inside to coordinate the evacuation or give updates on the situation on board. So the logistics for a search and rescue mission became a nightmare. And it was borderline dangerous for the Coast Guard personnel. Those are the reasons why Gregorio de Falco was so pissed about the mess the captain has just dumped on him. So the captain makes it to shore. From here, we only have mainstream news reports to rely on, so it's not going to be super accurate. But they say that Giglio's police chief then finds 110 survivors on the rocks at Point Gabianara. And among them is the captain. It's not known whether the captain helped anyone while he was there. And in fact, the police chief claimed that he just sat on the rocks and watched other people do so the rescue. Useless. A while later, a rescue boat picks up the captain and takes him to the harbor. He speaks to the police. He then finds the ship's onboard chaplain, Father Rafael Molina, and cries to him for about 15 minutes. Then he goes to the harbor master's office to receive. I do hope that a real harbor master's office is better than this old cabin. Probably the biggest dressing down of his entire life. Well deserved. Port authorities well ask deserved. the taxi driver to take the captain back to his hotel. The captain takes the 30 second cab ride to the Bahamas Hotel. According to the cabbie, he was beaten like a dog. He was cold and afraid. He only asked me where he could buy a pair of fresh socks. But then he perked right up again and gave an interview to a news crew. He told them that he was the last to leave. The captain is usually the last to abandon ship. What happened, Captain? We were the last to leave the ship. You gotta be kidding me. What a liar. All day Saturday, rescue a search for people on the ship. On Sunday morning, a South Korean couple is found in their cabin, safe but shivering. They had slipped through the crash and woke up unable to exit their cabin. The last survivor. See, every ship is required to have an emergency mustard list. Essentially, during a crisis situation, every employee has a specific task attributed to them. 
Some are designated firefighters, some have to get the lifeboats ready, and some are supposed to do a round, checking every passenger's cabin to make sure they're all empty. But the issue here is that the captain didn't immediately declare the state of emergency. He just gave confusing orders. Uh, everything is fine, so everyone back to their cabins. Uh, actually they should go to their master stations, but we're not abandoning ship, but, but kinda, but not really. At this point, the emergency muster list became a free-for-all. So I guess that's why the cabin round wasn't done. Manrico Giampandroni was found with a broken leg. He was the cabin service director. In the end, 32 people died. The final body wasn't discovered until nearly three years later. A crew member, Russell Rebello, and it's believed that he died a hero helping passengers off the ship. The Costa Concordia was the largest cruise ship disaster since the Titanic. And then there's the ship. This is what happens to a 110,000 ton cruise liner when it's left half rolled over in the ocean. Unbelievable. Oof, the bridge is in a mess. You know, there's actually a good life lesson in all that. All that wealth and luxury, it can all disappear in an instant. Especially when it comes in contact with water. Water is a destructive force of nature. But this isn't the end, it's just the halfway point. What most people know is that the Costa Concordia had crashed, many dead, and then the captain abandoned ship like a coward. <laughs> but there's a whole veritable spaghetti of details to untangle. Let's dive in. Oh, there they are. <laughs> oh, the what deets. a mess. Oh. <laughs> The Costa Concordia was more than just a floating resort. There's a mall, a casino, cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah, little side note on that. This is the reason why I consider cruise ships very unsafe. All those extra sections make the superstructure ridiculously long. Just look at the ratio between a vessel's draft and air draft. It's absurd. And it totally messes up with the stability of the ship. Because it moves the center of gravity away from the center of buoyancy. Now, I know they had stabilizers to help the situation, but that's a small patch, not a fix. So yeah, I don't consider them safe, but that's my personal opinion. This iron chest was full of safes and cash registers and expensive fittings. And there were plenty of gamers prepared to sneak by authorities and try their luck in the hot zone. Within days, police divers reported that valuable items, once seen lying around the ship, were now missing. High-end liquor, expensive furniture, Dining sets, cash from the casino, cash registers, jewelry and display cabinets, safes, Japanese woodblock prints by famous 18th century artists, what a city as well as the iconic bell, which hung from the bridge of the ship. It was never found. <laughs> Who steals a big fuck off bell? <laughs> yeah, really? Server admins were getting involved. Four divers who were part of the company contracted to refloat the Concordia were spotted on CCTV, sneaking out to the ship. <laughs> No way. It was dispatched, and the men were caught inside the fancy suites with rucksacks full of stolen goods. The four men are charged with stealing and thieving and pension. Fortunately, that is something that I never had to deal with here in Canada. Obviously, we do have to set a perimeter when there is a wreck. But I've never heard from any Coast Guard or police officer that they had to deal with dire thieves. Probably because the water is always too freaking cold here. Later on, stolen as well as legitimate items found their way to Amazon and eBay. <laughs> Chips from the casino, postcards, and cabin access cards became highly sought after souvenirs. It even has a watermark. Some Australian guy even made a listing for the ship itself, advertising it as buyer to collect. <laughs> and although there were plenty of bidders, no eBay way. pulled the plug.
I know you want to see Scatino go to jail, and we'll get to that. But first, mm -hmm. we have to talk about someone else. Dominica Samorta. Ah, that was yes. a close there was speculation that she was on the bridge that evening because she was the captain's mistress. Mm -hmm. Intense media speculation reports that her presence distracted the captain. They both denied their love for years and maintained that they were just friends. Although she did later admit to the media that she found him handsome. And how could you not? You so fucking precious when you smile. But she <laughs> says there was no romantic link between them. Some people would like to believe, they want to know I have something with him. It's more interesting. It's like, you know, some spicy Slicing. in the story. Mr. Morton also loved the spotlight, however. Oh, everyone! Oh, look! And took several interviews. But as the pressure mounted upon her, she began making ominous threats to Scatino, saying he must confess, and that you have but one week to come clean. But things from here get weird. Spicy. Sir Morton is a bit of a wild card. <laughs> In a subsequent interview, she claimed a helicopter came to the ship well before the other rescue craft to take away a package. Huh? And what was that package? Drugs, apparently. So rumors began that the ship was running narcotics for the Mafia. And not without cause, a number of cruise ships, even recently, have been caught trafficking drugs. As an aside, Scutino was tested for drugs immediately after the crash. He tested negative for drugs in his system, okay. but trace amounts of cocaine were found in a hair sample. Makes it smoother and... The law is actually very strict about taking the watch while under the influence. In fact, if another officer comes to relieve me from the watch, but I have any doubts regarding his sobriety, I am obligated to keep the watch and call the captain. Less dry? Nonetheless, the Concordia was searched and no drugs were reportedly ever found. How did we get here? Okay. Oh right, a helicopter. Sir Morton commented on it again the next day and said, actually, that helicopter was just for the captain as a means of evacuation from the ship. Okay, wait, so she expected to get some sort of first class rescue while everyone else was still stuck on the ship? No way. There's no way they would have evacuated the captain first. He is supposed to stay on board to coordinate the evacuation. That's some serious bullshit, Monica. Wait, how did we get here? <laughs> oh, right, sex with the captain. Divers were quick to head to the captain's cabin where they found Miss Morton's lingerie and other articles of clothing as well as a makeup bag. Who The jig busted. was up, but they continued denying it. Sir Morton mostly faded from international attention until she was told to appear before the court to present witness testimony. The judge pressed her to be truthful about their relationship, or she would be held in contempt. Either tell me the truth or shut up. So finally, she admitted it. She, yes, I had a sentimental relationship with the captain. Stop. But now, stop asking about my private life. She was indeed the captain's lover. What is up, Troubler Nation? What's it he not cheated on his wife with C Mortan? Oh my god! <laughs> she and Scatino had been having an affair for several weeks. She also said that on the night she boarded, she didn't have a ticket. Ticket, please. And didn't need to pay because nobody questions you when you're the captain's lover. Yeah, I also had a captain who gave special privileges to women he was attracted to. Naturally, she gave another confusing interview after leaving court. I want to say that today is the second time I die because the first time I die in the night of the crush with my psychological brain and uh, problems. And today I die the second time because, of course, people <laughs> find out something that I try to hide. Sheesh. I thought my English was bad. Subsequent to the trial, she used her fame in Moldova to become a political activist, often appearing on television and radio and in articles covering protests, accompanied by pictures of her being arrested by police. It was some stuff about victims of violence, women's rights, Girl power. yada yada yada, and interestingly, part of a push to block the sale of shares of Moldova's train network 
to Russia. Sure, sure. Other than that, I don't really know what she's been up to. Let me just check on her ins. No, oh, God, not again. <laughs> oh, no. Several civil suits were quickly lodged against Costa Crochier, and their parent company, Carnival Cruises, immediately saw a share drop of 23%. Don't beat. Passengers sought compensation for their damaged mental health, lost belongings, and loved ones. Either they allowed him to divert from his course, or they didn't know where their billion dollar ship was. Within a few days, facing financial and media pressure, the CEO attempted to join the bandwagon against the captain and the crew. That was not the ordinary route that the ship was taking at the time, and, and was not only taking, but the time the, the ship Today, was... Junior. Claiming that the ship was not approved to deviate from the route. But that wasn't true. Approval isn't required if the ship is deviating by less than 15 miles, or that it was against company rules. Also on... Yeah. The company has nothing to do with the passage plan. The captain is the one approving it or not. And he can modify it however he wants, whenever he wants. The main reason they would do so is usually to avoid a storm. Now, I'm aware that in the industry, some companies would actually put the pressure on their captains to ignore the risk and reach their destinations as fast as possible. Because investigators found that they didn't have any rules about deviating route, and they tacitly encouraged sale by salutes. Now, in response <laughs> to the civil suits, Costa Crochier offered passengers 11,000 euros each as compensation. That's kind of small. Mm -hmm. 11,000 euros, about $14,000 is the minimum compensation under international law when a <laughs> ship is abandoned. This was to reimburse them for their tickets, as well as any costs they accrued in having to unexpectedly travel home early. And that was supposed to release them from everything and anything that has to do with this accident. I cannot ask for more than this. A lot of passengers, understandably, were not too happy with this deal, and they refused to take the money. We think the offer is an insult for what these poor passengers went through we think that the compensation being offered is not commensurate. Here. Take it. <laughs> nice reference. Being offered is not commensurate. Later, Costa Crochier would lodge a plea deal with the Tuscany court to pay a 1 million euro fine to avoid a criminal trial. The judge agrees. Costa Crochier is now off the hook for all criminal liability for the whole thing. They've washed their hands of the incident and flecked the residual droplets of responsibility onto the faces of six staff members. Passengers and relatives of the dead are livid that the company has been able to avoid criminal responsibility. Offered is not commensurate. Civil suits against the company continue. By the way, the residents of the island of Giglio also banded together and sought damages. They didn't get much. <laughs> Eventually, passengers who refused the initial compensation of 11,000 joined civil parties against Scatino in his trial in 2015. It's not they were awarded 30,000 euros each. Other cases, especially those involving lost relatives, are settled for undisclosed amounts. New York attorney Peter René traveled to Budapest to represent six real survivors of the disaster. At René and René, we personally work on every case. And we'll work harder than anyone to get you the most money possible in the shortest amount of time. And while on the job, a seventh case cropped up via mail. email. An elderly woman, a loner, said, Help me, Mr. René, for I have lost my daughter, Eva, and my five-year-old granddaughter, Roxana. So Mr. René agreed to speak with her. However, there were some inconsistencies in her story. Neither Eva nor Roxana were on the passenger list. Odd, okay. but Costa is known for having stowaways. Gotcha, bitch. Still, Mr. Renai was suspicious. They wouldn't cheaty old Petey, would they? Renai inquired further about why she was on board, especially without a ticket. Ilona said, Well, I don't know, but you should ask her boyfriend. Zolt Horvath. He'll know all the details. I'm he looks so sketchy. Crazy, he said. But Mr. Renai was still suspicious. Mm -hmm. Because then she asked, How much money do you think this is worth? Uh... This is a huge red flag, Petey. 
In 20 years of doing this, you've never had anyone ask about money. Why now? So Mr. Renai hired an investigator and sent photos around of the missing girl. The next day, the phone rang. Oh, hoi hoi. It was the boyfriend again. Ah, uh, look, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding and the child isn't missing at all. Uh-huh. And then he claimed he was confused because he had done too many drugs the night before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, that's Can legit. I speak to the daughter then. At first, he was refused. So Renai said that he'd have to file a missing persons report to the police if he couldn't. The boyfriend relented. That night, Renai met with Zolt and brought the police with him. He speaks to the granddaughter and asks her if she's seen mum. Yeah, I saw her today. Oh, really? Yeah, we went to the park today and we went on the swings. Oh no, the jig was up. So the mum walks into the room sheepishly. It's a miracle! And the story changed again. Okay, I'm not dead, but I did injure me leg when I jumped from the ship. And then I immediately flew back to Budapest. <laughs> Although, don't worry about checking my leg because there are no visible marks or injuries. Uh, old Petey, I'm beginning to think they weren't even on the boat. <laughs> also, it turns out this lady isn't her mum, it's just a neighbour. Eventually, Renee managed to make the pair confess. And then they said, hey, we haven't done anything wrong. We haven't taken any money. And in the end, it looks like there'll be no criminal punishment for the scam. Because Hungary, a former communist country, has no laws against insurance fraud on the books. Aww. The law firm that never sleeps, call 1-800-664-7. Oh, that's a bad idea. Oh, that's a very bad idea. Oof. Mario, would you teach me some Italian? Oh, of course. Get back on board for fuck's sake. Okay, thanks. Gregorio de Felco, the naval officer who shouted at Scatino to Vada a bordo caso, became a bit of a national hero overnight in Italy. He, like the rest of the world, expected Scatino to go down with the ship. And when the captain chickened out, De Falco was there to admonish him. And when he stopped answering the radio, he called him on his cell phone to continue putting him on blast. <laughs> I'm guessing the reason he turned off the radio was because he knew that everyone that was on this channel could listen to the conversation. So he probably wanted to make his sorry excuses in private. When the captain first reported just a blackout, De Falco didn't believe the story and immediately began preparing a rescue effort, which likely saved several lives. By the way, that was a tough call to make. Sending a Coast Guard personnel to assist a ship that is not officially in distress is a hard decision. It can potentially put you in an embarrassing situation with your superiors. You really gotta trust your gut feelings on this. I know I would have probably chickened out. So yeah, he has my respect. His actions were applauded by most Italians who were tired of their public servants being corrupt and avoiding responsibility. Accordingly, shirts sporting Vada a bordo car I need that shirt. by the end of the week. Others setting it as their phone's ringtone. But then, in September 2014, without warning, DeFalco was transferred to an admin role in the Coast Guard. Oh, no. Hear what I said, he'd been demoted. DeFalco said that he had been passed up for promotion, that he had also not been told which admin office he was even being transferred to, and that it all effectively cancelled 10 years of his career. DeFalco was Triz. Furioso. Terrible. And it was public speculation that it was owing to bad blood between himself and Admiral Delano, his former boss. His status among the public overshadowed his superior in many ways. On the other hand, his boss said, Ah, no, it's part of a normal career progression for naval officers and that he must show more maturity and professionalism to advance his career. As far as I'm aware, that is not something you would see in the Canadian Coast Guard. And trust me, there's plenty of political bullshit and dick moves here too. But I haven't seen or heard anything as bad as this. That is not how you treat such an outstanding officer. That guy was just being a jerk. Now, it's hard to know what's true in office politics, so let's leave that alone. And okay. anyway, in 2018, DeFelco said buenas noches, ya later, to the Italian Navy to become a politician. In March that year, he was elected to the nice. Italian Senate, serving as a member for Livorno. He still serves there today. I'm the company now. Good. I'm glad for him. He deserves it. <laughs> All right. 
The day after the disaster, Scatino was taken into custody by police and underwent questioning. However, it was clear that this would not be a straightforward investigation. So the judge released him under house arrest at his home in Sorrento, a town in Napoli. By July of that year, the house arrest was relaxed and he was allowed within this general area. While under house arrest, he wrote a book with this journalist from Rye magazine. I have no idea what it says, I don't speak Italian. But goddammit, he must have some kind of charisma going on, because there's been a lot of speculation in the press that he had an affair oh, with no. her as well. You can't keep getting away with it! Hold on, I got it, I got it. Not content with abandoning his ship, this dude is determined to abandon his wife as yeah. well. So, Scatino and five others are facing criminal charges. Straight away, everyone lodges a plea bargain with the court. And all of those plea bargains are accepted, except for Scatino's. And the condition of everyone's reduced sentences are that they must provide witness testimony against Scatino. Mm -hmm. He touched me. Ciro, Jacob, and Sylvia were all given suspended sentences. Roberto and Manrico are... By the way, a navigation officer cannot fully be held accountable for a ship collision. The captain is the direct representative of the bridge. So even if he hadn't been on the bridge at the moment of the collision, he would still have been legally responsible for it. In this case, what the other officers were probably charged with was the fact that they abandoned their duty while there were still some passengers to evacuate. Deal. A good deal. Mm -hmm. Good deal. And that meant that Scatino was now all on his own. Ciro, the first officer, was the first to give his testimony. On the witness stand, he claimed that Scatino was distracted by his mistress and other guests on the bridge. <laughs> That there was confusion over who was in command. <laughs> then it was Jacob's turn. And he said, Lamau XD, because he didn't actually bother with his testimony or his reduced sentence. He just fled the country. It took authorities 12 months to eventually track him down on the outskirts of Jakarta. And when they said, Oi, we still want that witness testimony, he just scalped again. And he hasn't been found since. After that, Ferrarini <laughs> gave his testimony, then Sil uh, look, we don't have time to relitigate the whole trial. So let's just go straight to the verdict. Guilty! Yeah. Scatino was found guilty of multiple manslaughter, causing a shipwreck, abandoning ship, and lying to authorities. He is sentenced to 16 years and one month in prison. Mm-hmm. But wait, there's still the appeals. The appeals trial begins. And the verdict on the appeal? Surprise! Rejected! There you go. So Scatino's lawyers appealed again. And the verdict on the final appeal? Scatino made multiple attempts to secure a plea deal, but was denied by the prosecution each time. The prosecution called for Scatino to be sentenced to 26 years in prison, calling the incident a titanic affair. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Scatino was not present. His lawyer stated that he was waiting outside of the jail for the ruling, so that if his plea was rejected, he could immediately start serving his sentence. And with that, five years and four months after the disaster, he was finally in a cell. I will not be making any comments. Oh, oh, that the salvage operation was enormous. It took over two years and cost an estimated $1.2 billion. Remember when I said in the first video, whenever you have a serious incident, you have three priorities to follow. Number one, save the lives of your crew members. Number two, save your ship. Well, that's the reason. Beginning in early 2012, they first spent two months pumping fuel from the ship's tanks. At the same time, they had to pump seawater in so that the balance wasn't affected and the ship didn't slide around. In early 2013, a platform was built under the ship to prevent it from falling further. Sponsons were then attached to the sides of the ship and cables attached to the underwater platform. The sponsons were then dragged underwater and opened up to allow the... Very well to planned. The ship could then roll over properly. By late 2013, the ship was upright once more. The sponsons were then attached to the side of the ship to help keep it balanced. It now rested partially above water and crews could walk around safely. By July 2014, the water was removed from the sponsons and compressed air was pumped in to lift the ship. 
Fun fact. I actually did work with the Navy to extract a shipwreck stuck in Cape Breton. I think the worst moment is when we pull it out of the water. Oof. The smell was almost unbearable. Obviously, it was on a much smaller scale than this. There are two main things you want to prevent. First, an oil spill. That's what those red balloons surrounding the ship are for. Second, you don't want the structure to slide and get out of control. And she was ready to cruise again. This time to a port in Genoa. It was a four-day towing journey to the docks where a two-year process of dismantling and recycling would begin. That same weekend of the towing, Scatino was busy. He was the guest of honor at a white party on an island in the Bay of Naples. He appeared on the front page of a local newspaper, flanked by two of Italy's most eligible <sighs> bachelorettes. And we've reached the end. Great video. Thank you so much, crew members, for expressing your desire for me to finish the cost of Concordia. I heeded your advice and it was worth it. Turns out I did have more stuff to say and I'm glad I did. And again, Internet Historian did an amazing job. Great summary of the whole event, very well presented. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, make sure to leave a thumbs up and subscribe for extra content. And as always, sell safe.